Thank you, Michelle. And hi, everyone. Hey, everyone. We are here in the in the mountains in the northern Spain, so I hope our connection will be good. I don't see all your faces. Some people are um, without the camera on, but already I see some familiar faces. It's good to see you. And uh, yeah, to introduce ourselves maybe briefly. Um, Egor here. And I'm Sabina and Nea. And I have here Bia. There are this maybe you can see them so we are basically we're not alone here indeed human but not only um, we are in a very beautiful landscape of Galicia and we will be yeah we're happy to to join you from here and to happy to see you all joining us uh, from all the different places in the world it's actually also really nice for us to 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 get to know you a little bit who is in the room if you hey don't don't bite um if you don't mind to just write maybe in the chat your name or what brings you here we are very curious what inquiries you are pursuing if you're part of a conversity as well or guest or yeah maybe just a little bit for us to get to know you as well um uh, who is in the in the room and then there will be hopefully also an, an interaction towards uh, second part of this session and in the meantime it's also nice um, yeah, Michelle mentioned embodied culture so uh, in our work we try to include the body back into not only the center of conversation but also of attent attentiveness and kind of uh, presence so if you like, we can also begin just by a moment of silence and connecting to the body, connecting to the breath, connecting to the air or this mystery that we call air that also unites us in a way. You know, the particles that we breathe here in the north of Spain might have been in places where you are at the moment and have kind of already connected us also not only thanks to technology, but also through as the Inuit say silla the air the atmosphere so yeah let's let's maybe just take a moment we will call you back into the into the shared space but just let's take a moment to to breathe and to pay attention to this moment of breathing in and breathing out and circulation in between if you like to close your eyes you can and to feel your feet on the ground so just maybe a moment of grounding in your each in our own ways whatever we feel comfortable with and at the same time if you want you could switch to the gallery view so that you acknowledge all the other participants here so kind of this grounding will be a collective experience in a way
Oops. <laughs> So um, I, I just want to take a, another minute or so to, to read what you wrote in the chat. But before, also thanks so much to organizers of this conference. We are very happy to be here. We were invited last year but couldn't make it. It was a very full year. Um, and now we are very grateful and happy to, to be here and part of this uh, beautiful gathering. Thanks so much for introducing yourselves. It's an amazing c uh, company, an amazing com uh, community, a little community, little collective body that is forming itself for this workshop. And many lands, many lands that are that are meeting. Yeah, again to acknowledge again this land. It's um, we are near some very old, 400-year-old uh, castañas, like a chestnut trees. Um, kind of elders of this of this place where we are at the moment. And Foresta Collective is a kind of nomadic collective at the moment uh, because we used to be based in Berlin, but now we feel that it's time for us to move on from the city to. Um, yeah, to be more connected to the land, to, to a place um, in a more wild, maybe, environment. So we are currently a bit on the move for the past few years. And I will, uh, I will begin by introducing Foresta for you. And I, I see a lot of people are educators and activists and artists and researchers. So we will introduce a little bit our work with Foresta and so that hopefully to give you also some cues or clues about our methodologies and there will be also time to practice a bit. Um, for the practice, I just want to say now, we didn't really communicate it in advance, but we thought now uh, we will try to introduce all our practices and one of them is art, thinking and making. And if you have somewhere close by a possibility to write or to um, like a, any kind of graphic material like a pen or pencil or whatever that whatever you like to make to leave some traces and paper if there if you have it that's great if not no worries we'll kind of try to work our way around but for now I will just share my screen I don't know if I can make this yeah, smaller. Like this. No, I think I think only Michelle can do it. But no, it's okay. We should be able to do it, but we don't see how to. It's okay. Let's okay. Do it. So, do you see the screen well? Because on my screen, there are all the people's faces are on the on the top, but you see them well. I see the uh, screen with the on the left side and uh, the row of faces on the right side. Um, okay, but you can read the text. No, it's not on the text. No, is everybody else reading? Okay, I am reading. Okay. Okay, great, perfect. Yeah, so, so um, you know, we always struggle with saying what is Foresta Collective, and we try to avoid kind of fixed definitions and leave space for for this kind of emergent practice that that uh, that Foresta Collective is and and also 
who are the members of the collective. We, that's why we say human, but not only. We will introduce a bit this idea of not only that we learned with Marisol de la Cadena, the Peruvian um, anthropologist. Um, but yeah, I'll speak about this a bit a bit later. But just to give you an orientation, so what we like, how we like to think of Foresta is that we create uh, spaces or co-create spaces for symbiotic cultivation of more ecological futures or what we understand with ecologists, in a way, not separating the inner ecologists from the outer ecologists or personal ecologists from relational spaces. Um, I will speak a bit about it in a second. Uh, the core elements of our work, um, yeah, the natural world is extremely important for us. Uh, definitely they are mo the more than human uh, part of Foresta Collective is a, is a, is a very core uh, part of the core team, if I may say so. It's always a bit of a struggle to find the right words. Uh, we see our work as transdisciplinary research practice as one word. So we try not to separate research from practice and practice from research. So it's kind of um, mutually nourishing ideas, I guess, and, and ways of learning. Embodied culture definitely is a is, is very important um, element in our work. And what I mentioned before, art thinking and making, or what we now started calling thinking through making. So, so kind of art, uh, arts offering this door to enter more intuitive, experimental, poetic uh, spaces. And um, yeah, poetry is um, also as a Cuban poet, uh, Mauri Pacheco calls it operational poetics, no? to have the poetry as a, as a kind of a guiding. Um, principle. How can I? Basically, the the last one was collective practice, and this is also we will try to do it today. Let's see if 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 it works. Um, so today we would like to speak about two projects a little bit to introduce our work, which is <laughs> the cats are run, running around. Um, we will speak about a little bit about Seasonal Academy. It's our self-organized kind of learning format with, through collective practice and with adults. Currently it's online. Um, and while stories or stories from the forest are a format for kids and families. So, uh, Seasonal Academy is um, this, we learned this idea also with a, with a thinker, Stephen Wright, who is, speaks about uh, perma-artistic practice, and this, this is a kind of um, a spark to how we also understand Seasonal Academy as this kind of concentric circles but maybe it's also not circles like now we are thinking maybe it's actually a spiral not a circle but basically we like to think of this uh, circles of intimacy of ecological intimacy where we begin with personal ecologists so we begin with a kind of more inner journey and moving towards and that, uh, also just to interrupt myself to say that uh, we work seasonally so we feel that uh, each circle is connected to a season, and for us, autumn is the time for this more personal ecologies. Winter now, we just yesterday we finished the relational space, the winter trail, um, and spring, for us, it's a lot about intentions, it's about seeding, idea seeding, so it's basically a bit learning from plants. Um, and the summer trail, gentle steps, is a lot about fruiting. So it's about uh, lending livelihoods and how do we actually live practically in, in this world, in this um, other ways, in this more ecological uh, ways. And um, yeah, f our format for children is mainly has been rooted in Berlin. So, so at the moment we are uh, kind of 
on pause with it because we are ourselves at the moment not in Berlin mm, and we are we have been resisting for two years to bring our work with kids online because you know kids and screens it's it's a tricky it's a cr tricky subject but now it might be that we will indeed you know, start the ecological storytelling uh, also for kids online and that's it actually because woods in the city is a bit of a, i can show you but this this less about education this is more about collective practice this is uh, our our, we think of it as our playground, as a kind of experimentation space. Um, but maybe this is for another, for another talk, for another time. Um, I, I, I just wanted to briefly introduce our educational formats that that we work with. And, and we also want to invite you to into practice a little bit, but maybe before we do that, I want to, I, I promised uh, to share with you a story or what we learn with Marisol de la Cadena, because this not only, we just finished the, uh, the, the winter trail, so it's part of the winter trail, so it's also still very fresh for us, but just generally this story, um, we find it very important, or it has been very important for our work. So Marisol de la Cadena, um, she has engaged uh, with ethnographic research in Peru. Uh, she spent there, I think, 10 years conducting fieldwork, but also learning and really questioning her role as anthropologist with two, with a family of two, two shamans, two father and son. Quechua uh, people who, who lived in the highlands of Cusco and uh, she has been learning with them and told us this story also with a lot of attention and care and we want not to uproot this story from that lens and kind of also try to give it further with a lot of attention and care so that we kind of um, Not that we don't uproot the local knowledge and worlding practice, but kind of share an insight into this thinking otherwise. So, um, so the story Marisol told us is, on the one hand, is, is about this unity of how she and Mariano and Nazario, they all grew up in Peru, so they had a lot of things in common, or from this kind of one world world, at the same time, um, she was discovering with them that actually the world is of many worlds. And um, one day they were walking through these spectacular landscapes in the highlands in Andes. And um, Mariano and Nazario shared with Marisol that a mountain, mount, mountain that, that, that lives there, that stands there, Ausangate is the name of this mountain, is a person. And Marisol was kind of, we could say, surprised by that fact, because in her perception, a mountain is not a person, but geology. So, um, so, so, so she told us a story of um, of questioning this kind of maybe colonialist in some way role of an anthropologist that comes to a culture uh, to study that culture and automatically translates things that are, are not from their culture into cultural belief. So she had to fight this and to she was uh, also saying how she was searching a different relationship with Mariano and Nazario, not a typical kind of interlocutor, um, not from the same world, so to say, but 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 really, yeah, more a more aware, a more a more reciprocal relationship where 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 you know being aware of cultures or worlds of each other and respecting this difference and kind of giving space for this difference. Um, 
and 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 Marisol was speaking to us how how you know her culture or the culture of anthropology um, treated the knowledge of mountain is a person as a cultural belief and and how 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 that was the the huge the huge obstacle to 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 these relationships that that they were building and 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 kind of so so she needed to overcome this treating the mountain or or this cultural belief as a reality of so to say kind of a second order right not not like what what is really really true so for us this was for our work within foresta this was a very important very important to understand because we 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 are very interested in other ways of knowing and and you know through working with arts and with a body and and at the same time we are also very grateful for things we learn within academia uh, when we are we, when we were there so so how do these worlds meet right like this was i guess our our um, our inquiry and 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 so this this uh, story was something that made made us think and that became quite rooted in in uh, in in our in our work and mainly the idea of not only so this is what we learned with with Marisol what Marisol learned well, I remember or there's there's this um um phrase that Marisol te was telling us that also Nazario and Mariano were, were uh, help, trying to help her, no? to say, no Marisol, just think of not only a mountain, think that this mountain is not only a mountain and leave it open, just open the not only and you don't need to know what else it is, just, you know, allow for this possibility that it's also something else and don't try to explain it because you can't, no, it's like, um, it's not available to, to explain, but how to be with this unknown and be okay with it and not needing to fill in the space because we cannot. Mm. So, so yeah, this not only is, it has been a, has been a crucial uh, step also for us to, to, in our work within our educational formats. And I guess I guess we could just jump into practice. Yeah, or slowly step into it. Or slowly flow <laughs> into it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we, we could perhaps share a practice as a way to um, to approach uh, this orientation and, and this uh, possibility of, of knowledge production of something that w we are using and perhaps uh, could be interesting for you as well in the, in the educational practice you are doing um, in the ways of situating knowledge uh, not only in place-based but also in body as something which is body rooted and in the spirit of entanglement um, with and embeddedness into the living world uh, where we find ourselves we invite you now to spend a few moments in this next uh, few minutes first of all centering on the multiplicities that each of you are wherever you are at the moment um, so I'll be guiding this with some language um, this is both, let's say, uh, a pedagogical tool and a, and a sort of a meditation. So uh, let's go into this together. So perhaps if we come to how we started this session, uh, taking a deeper breath, maybe start to breathe a little bit more than normal and feeling your legs and kind of innerly scanning your body and focusing on this idea and this sensation of me being a hollow biont, this echo, this living ecosystem that is consisting of 
myriads of bacteria and other living organisms that make up what I am, really. An ecosystem inside and yet situated and entangled into other ecosystems around. So a complex system that I am, not just on the purely biological level, but also uh, as an interplay of physical sensations and emotions and thoughts, ideas. memories so let's just spend a few moments centering on this experience wherever each of you are finding groundedness in this experience So this is a way, a way of expanding our sense of self. And from here, perhaps expanding your space of attention a little bit more to include um, other beings around you. And this is an invitation now for each of you to choose one being it may be perhaps a plant in the space where you are or a tree that you see through your window or perhaps another person or an animal next to you or for that matter a stone an object to choose choose a being that you want to to invite as a companion into this little practice in the next few minutes. Inviting this being into your expanded sen sense of attention, expanded sense of self for that matter, and asking actively a question if you my companion, you are not only that, let's say, a tree. Just connecting, just connecting with them. So sitting, sitting with this question while feeling the expanded field of possibilities of who that being might be if this is if he or she or they are not just this word that you would normally call them this concept that the, that the knowledge system that you normally use is giving you as a category so this is something that a scientist an anthropologist like Marisol or a philosopher like Bio Akumalafi might might use the term to call this an onto epistemological opening. But let's just let's just look at it as a door into the into an unknown array of possibilities. Mm. 
And in this relational space, in which you are at the moment with this other being, through your ex expanded attention, allowing for perhaps an, a reciprocity to, to, to surface, kind of offering your presence to that being and noticing how they might be offering their presence to you. Mm. And sensing if, if through that there may be a heightened level of connection, or perhaps a certain possibility for bonding even. So while you're curious about them, you're also feeling the multiplicities and indeterminacies that they are, and you are with them. And from here, perhaps, is the next step. <laughs> um, <laughs> coming back to to this attentiveness to your to your bodily sensations, like to this home of 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 experiences and knowledge that you are as a body, and searching for for a sensation of expansion e expansion as a container for more than one world that you could be in because in our experience is this is this a physical sensation of shrinking f from whatever it might be from from a, from a fear from from a trauma, from from any experience that that might feel like shrinking, that immediately causes for the one, for the world, for the truth to stand up and 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 be there, kind of in a hierarchy of of knowledges and truths. So let's kind of, let's try to democratize that by coming into this more expanded place as a physical sensation as much as we can in this little time that we are doing this together now and just maybe to add to this uh, from my side uh, you know this what happens now in ukraine we were very affected by that because we know people in ukraine we know people in russia we have friends in both countries and it was very painful to yeah to to see what is happening um and and this expansion actually was really really a helpful practice in these days yesterday the day before today you know to to, to digest to to contain even this horrible basically staying with the trouble right as donna haraway and other people put it and 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 expanding and allowing space and allowing also the emotions it's like water to to kind of go through us and to not trying to control it and i think this is also can be a challenge because the one world world can say no don't feel those emotions they are scary or they are bad or whatever but i guess this practice of expansion liberates emotions to be also part of human intelligence so kind of this emotional intelligence that can also um, open doors for other ways of knowing and 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 for and for us it was a lot of kind of realizing or wishing to trust the emotional intelligence of people in russia people in ukraine that that somehow the situation they will manage to 
they will manage to, to solve it. Because emotional intelligence doesn't have hierarchy. It's not, it doesn't have this kind of cognit cognitive hierarchies and ideas, and it's not into any kind of theories, right? Like it's just pure heart kind of speaking. So just wanted to add this. Thank you. also opening up kind of into the unfamiliar what you said mm -hmm. but at the same ground at the same time grounding in, into some kind of a truth mm. because emotional emotional centeredness is, is a way in a, an emotional truth And from here, I invite you to sense in your body a gesture. So a movement, it doesn't have to be a big movement, it might, it, it might be a, a, an imperceptible to the, to the other person, but a movement that you, that you sense is there. And see if there is any gesture that is born naturally from how you are right now in this in this moment of communion with the other creature that you chose to pay attention to and be in reciprocity with allowing for the space for not knowing so see if there is a movement that is being born from that in you You can be seated where you are or wh wherever you are. You can stand up if, if that helps you to be standing rooted on your feet and, and breathing and kind of really f feeling how your body reacts to this. So notice if there is a gesture. And, and once you've you, you've captured that, once once you've you've seen that, kind of pause with that gesture and see if if there are other possibilities, if there is another gesture that is maybe happening at the same time like a polyphony in in Bach's fugue or sonata another voice that your body is is manifesting through through a little movement somewhere Just another little moment to, to acknowledge that. And from here the invitation is to integrate this experience in a way that is fitting for you. Sabina mentioned earlier that it's good if you have a pen or a pencil or something to, to leave a trace with to put a word or, or a drawing or a, a piece of paper um, as well so I invite you now to remember fabrics. With fabrics, people could also draw. <laughs> like if you don't have a, if you don't have a graphic material you can also like I have this scarf I could now draw with the scarf on the ground or I could take a piece of earth and or a stick you know it can you can draw with shadows from objects you know it's it's really kind of this this just opening up the the creativity that how it wants to be expressed through you in this moment so the invitation is to remember that gesture or a few gestures that you might have noticed uh, in your body and without thinking at all express that 
put that trace on paper or on the snow or on the ground or in the fabric like Sabina mentioned like whatever materials are in front of you just don't, don't overthink that just le le let that gesture be manifested in in some traces that you can leave let's take four or five minutes yeah let's take perhaps four or five minutes for that don't stop yourself it might it doesn't have to be just some just one it might be a movement that follows another movement but do express those movements into some kind of gestures that can be seen that is something that that you can later look look on look upon or show to other participants or anybody else We'll call you back in two or three minutes. All right. So perhaps you could complete where you are with that and slowly come back into the into the common space. Those of you who who don't mind or who want to share, or just simply, would anyone like to share? Yeah. Uh, what we propose is maybe if you would like to share, if you could just speak so that you will appear on the on the screen, and just hold your uh, drawing to the camera, and then the rest of us we can just write what we see in the chat. We can we can we can offer our perspectives. Um, of what we see in that gesture uh, expressed in the graphic. Yeah. So whoever is sharing, do make some some noise so that Zoom listens to you, that technology, <laughs> and shows you. I, I want to make some noise. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I see you guys of Floresta Collective instead of the drawing. Maybe the person has to speak so we can you you come out. Pin like you can focus on oh, that oh, person's window and you can pin. pin it. Yes, you can. I'm going to I'm going to try and pin. Yes, Thank and the rest so. of us we Please can offer in. our perspective in the chat. So there is a speaker view. If you click on the speaker view. Uh, it would show the whole window. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much, Kan Kanwal. I hope I pronounce your name correctly. I believe Emma has her hand up, so I'm going to spotlight Emma. Apologies for how about come back to me and I will unblur filters none. There we go. Mm.
interesting. It was inspired by a long ongoing relationship with a piece of obsidian gifted to me from my grandmother from Aotearoa, my home, which is volcanic. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Are we good? Thank you, thank you, yes. There are two people yeah. have Yeah, Yeyo has his hand up, I see. I don't know if now he can see me because I can see myself. Let me see, yeah. Right there, I think. Pads. Nicarius. A chaotic mess, yeah, that is. Yeah, true. Garden flourishing, I love that one. Underwater wall, too. Endless flowers and flowers, also, I will add. Nets of collaboration. Many ways of navigating, being, and knowing. Yes, definitely. In the inquiry. Thank you all. And I just want to, aprovechando that I have the microphone to really, really bow and appreciate your bridging between worlds and, and the simplicity of the language in your explanations. It's really something to learn. Thanks so much. Muchas gracias. I think Daniela had his hand, her hand up. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I had some watercolor, luckily, so it's colorful. Maybe it's like that. Exploding spirulina, I like it. <laughs> Thank you. Lettuce, yeah, I, my bean is a, uh, how do you call it, cucumber. <laughs> Andrea Gatman has sent me a message. She can't hold up her hand, so I'm going to bring her to the spotlight for the floor. Please come closer to your camera. Thank, thank you. Thank you. So I connected to rocks, a path of rocks. And just before our guides mentioned water, I saw the water like historic water that made space in the rock and holding and then i saw a person reaching towards the rock bending and then looking for the others to come and then some kind of historic caravan bringing caravan sea people or i don't know because many territories seem to be here not only the place where i am right now thank you thank you for everything for all the words I just noticed you have to put up your drawing several times. So do you want to draw, show your drawing? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Because uh, 
Uh, I'm from Taiwan, and there's some participation from Taiwan also, and I'm the translate. So we, we had a Google Meet for uh, in Chinese. And this is my drawing as I show oh, my Taiwan, Taiwan companion. Mountain person. <laughs> Thanks everyone. <laughs> so we are doing the same sharing in Chinese also. And we're grateful to uh, have this practice together. <laughs> Great, thanks so much everyone. That's really beautiful. I, I, I just, before we end, I just wanted also to share my screen again because there are some acknowledgement for the illustrations and oh no no sorry that's not that <laughs> it's this is it this just to to bring us to the last slide here to acknowledge all the artists who who's collaborated with Foresta and collective and whose drawings and images are have been part of what i shared uh, in this presentation And perhaps while, while this slide is like a backdrop um, in the last two, three minutes of this hour and a half that we've been together, if, if there is anything that needs to be shared or anybody who wants to talk about your experiences or any questions or comments or answers, please feel free. Yes, we can just have a little... Uh... A question in the chat is asking if uh, your drawings can be at, could be added to the Ecoversities um, gallery. Well, that's a question to everyone, I guess, no? To who is here? Yes. I also want to add thanks for the the noise of silence. It, that really, Edler put it in the chat at the beginning, like we were meditating with this notion of isolations, you no, know, and you need to be in silence and lower focus, but we're never alone. So like it bring it to me at the beginning in the meditation, this sense of being always holded by the world because of the, the ambient that was shared from the location you choose to do this presentation. It was really bring something to understand the way you were sharing, you, the way you, you work. Mm. Thank you. We're also very grateful to this location to have invited us to do it here. Because we were not sure until the last moment where will we do this workshop today because we are a bit on the move but now this location said here and we're like okay there's a question in the chat from uh, laura uh, laura rios of of where are you uh, yeah this we mentioned in the beginning of the session we are in galicia now in the north of spain this is a very <clears throat> A very special land here and, and people because it's it's been a place where Celts lived and actually a few hundred meters from here in the mountains we went walking today and there are some excavations archaeologists have found um, incredible uh, dwellings of people who lived here probably two or three third second or third century BC like those uh, stone wooden houses with uh, uh, circular houses, circular, it's a circle. but as high as five meters high, 
but kind of currently dug inside uh, in, in, in the land, in the, in the earth. But other than that, it's very quiet here. There are a lot of oak trees, chestnut trees, and yeah, there are some bears and wolves, they say. And this is also a part of Galicia that is not... Um, maybe some of you know Galicia and Portugal are a bit... kind of became these plantations of uh, eucalyptus trees. And this part of Galicia is... There are no eucalyptus, eucalyptus trees. So there are mainly just uh, plants that live here uh, since, yeah. So it's kind of the biodiversity. Nothing against the eucalyptus tree, but when it takes away the biodiversity, then it becomes problematic. And here the biodiversity is thriving. Aditya, you are asking about the presentation. Um, I'm sure you can have access to the recording of this one. Um, so, and if if the presentations can be shared, then we'll, we'll definitely share ours. Yes. And because we're at the end of our time, perhaps and let there us. Was, uh, there was Daniela. You wanted to say something, no? Yeah, I was so thankful for your presentation. I don't know if we have time, but I was very curious how you work with kids. Like you did this session with us. Which methodology and how do you conduct this? when you work with children. I also work with children and uh, I'm wondering how to make, if you do also meditative work with them, because we I try. don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we try, it's always, it's always, I guess with each group, we need to see how to do it because some kids are very, very active and it's, we also don't want to kill their activity. You know, it's also to not to like, now we meditate and just like, <laughs> We try not to be dictators, but we do try to kind of join the energy that is there. Um. And play. Children, children might uh, be lured into meditative activities if, if there is a, an element of uh, wonder associated with that, a playful element of wonder. So we, we did have uh, some, some great experiences with like four and five year olds even. Um, where Im embodied awareness and also this kind of outside attention to the to the modern human world very nicely combined with their inner intensiveness because somehow it turned it turns out ask asking the right questions sometimes reveals that there is so much going inside the 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 the, the, the little person's imagination and and their inner world that they they just don't know how to express but once you, you perhaps allow them to put those, um, those traces on, uh, on a huge uh, stone or a huge piece of paper, um, provoking with some playful, uh, playful invitations, like, like maybe kind of co-telling a story with them, which involves what elements they perceive inside our, themselves and outside. Very often for, the, for a little chil children, this is gonna be the same, very much blurred. <laughs> and, and we were also very lucky now these animals uh, they are really saying you know we also are very happy that they're part of the conversation because indeed in Berlin uh, there were sheep that uh, we, we were working with children also in a natural park just outside of the city uh, where they have a sheep kind of sheep live there in the nature reserve uh, place and this is also very interesting because kids are very sensitive to, to animals. But of course, sometimes, you know, there is this kind of belief that children are sometimes nasty with animals. And then we, we, we made the experience that those children who were actually nasty with animals, their parents were nasty with them. Like, you know, you, you when parents come to recollect the children at the end and then they sp you hear how they speak like shut up or like they speak very roughly with, with kids and then you're like well yeah that's you know that's where it's also coming from so so I think like this kind of animals as teachers it's also very interesting like we, we work with this idea also here is one that just arrived oh does he eat, eat my phone? No. Okay. <laughs> she loves to eat the technological things. Yeah. It's not usual to taste it here in the countryside. But now she tr tasted a lot of this technology that connects us. 
yeah i guess so the the um the time uh, of this session is one and a half hours um so there's still some time for questions we started at 3 30 um based on your energy as well all oh, right so we still have time well, i thought we are already over time <laughs> Great, but then yeah, we can speak more definitely. Then there is time. Thank you for the reminder, Michelle. Or we can also finish earlier, you know, things finish when they finish. We also don't need to force it. <laughs> Sorry for being so boisy this session, but I'm just curious if you can share a little of how like life have changed now that you're in a nomadic mode, like what of being in centered in a place working in Berlin in from this part to now be moving around the world, how, what have shifted, what you can share from that experience. Hmm. Wow, there's uh, so much to say about this. Um... I would say the boldness to to dive into the waves of the um, uh, online uh, educational work that's been our experience because before before the nomadism and before the pandemic we were really very attached to the face-to-face -face work that we would do with adults and children and we felt that this this bonding that comes through through everyone being in the same physical space is is perhaps the only condition for for for, this work. for for the impact of this work that it can have and we were very skeptical about uh, you know zoom and and going online now pandemic forced us into that and uh, we discovered that this is actually um, an opportunity for creativity and finding ways to maybe hack uh, in this online spaces and kind of find the the cracks into the into the normal journeys through those online spaces and and make it more personal and the whole the whole foresta seasonal academy experience that sabina was talking about in the beginning has formed into its own new shape which is very um, kind of self-sufficient and in a way very different from what the work we did with adults before so now our seasonal academy has become this educational space for ecological sensing and finding uh, ecological livelihoods um, online basically it's, online it's really evolved online it evolved into something new b while being online so in a way we we are also grateful for this to to the pandemic because indeed we we learn so much it's uh, yeah. and i mean we feel that it's it's really worked even though we were skeptical in the beginning but there are also some people here who join some of the formats online that they should say if it's worked or not mm. Yeah, I can I can jump in. I've been so honored and blessed to meet you all in the last few years. And um, I haven't had the, the it hasn't been the right moment of synchronicity for me to do the seasonal academies. But every time the invitations come to me, I just feel so much the aliveness and the um, adaptability of the uh, invitations. And they're just like such enlivening and, and, cap and, and, and uh, captivating topics that you're exploring and i feel like what i've learned um, by just going to a few of the dojos um so exploring something for a few hours through different like um yeah phenomenological experiences or um looking at art together and then reflecting um i feel like what i appreciate well first of all that you both are so willing to like you're just always in a forest or like in some goat farm and and just that you're out in the world um doing these these experimental online sessions is um it brings the world into me um and then just your willingness to try things and so that's been really exciting i just love you guys and i love your work and i recommend to everyone check out the foresta collective and these seasonal academies uh look fabulous i hope soon I'd be able to join. Thanks so much. There's a question from um, Jing Lin. Sorry if I'm saying your name wrong. Yeah, yeah, you say my name right. 
Thank you. Um, I, I'm sorry I came in late. I heard only the very last part. I was in two other sessions. Um, anyway, but I, I got intrigued by your uh, discussion about children's attitude toward animals, uh, right? Uh, are influenced by their parents, right? Maybe influenced by the larger society. Um, I think just the, for example, the slaughtering of animals, right? And species extinction now needs to be central in education. So how, so what, what are your ideas or experiences of say, now uh, we socializing students, uh, uh, children to see animals, not as animals, but as, you know, human beings or other human beings or other living beings, right? So, so, so that we're learning not say, what is a wolf, but rather we ask the question, who is a wolf? And how's the wolf, like say, uh, right, uh, feeling and so on. So can you say something like, about that? Like how, what's our relationship with animals? And then how can we rekindle this uh, sense of universal, you know, family with uh, other species? Hmm. Thank you, Jin. I think you're touching on a few big things. One is definitely the language, like you mentioned, the switch from from the object to another subject in the room, like from what to who. Uh, we feel it's also important to do this with plants and also stones, uh, like any vibrant matter that is traditionally may not be regarded as alive. Because again, like even even tapping into the uh, into the prominent scientific uh, community, and of course, it's it's great to come to such uh, uh, rewarding references as, as Donna Haraway or Isabel Stengers or Lynn Margulis, uh, like people who have been showing that scientific method. There isn't wrong. There isn't anything wrong with the scientific method, but there, but there must be enough humility and enough bravery to debunk uh, some stale truths uh, in there. And I, I, this, this is just to say that the switch from uh, objectivizing to, I wouldn't even say subjectivizing, but kind of expanding, reciprocity. yeah, reciprocity through attentiveness but also expanding your notion of self into this larger self that includes, like we try to, to use the language by being with children in, in all our formats that is very attentive to, to how we name and the verbs we use um, that describe the interactions between different beings. Even the thing like a creature like we prefer to use the word being rather than a creature because a creature, let's say, might suppose that there is someone who created something else, like there is subject-object relationship, there is some religious maybe notion of, creator. you know, creator created the creatures. And but at the same time, you know, we also use the word co-creation. So, so you know, it's also a dance, it's also a playfulness, like it's a... Uh, but we really like... Um, this uh, this book song lines where Bruce Chatwin Chatwin right the, mm -hmm. the author talks about uh, how I th I guess he speaks about the Australia the Aboriginal culture in Australia and how people created themselves from clay how how the ancestors created themselves from clay rather than being created by someone and and this for us resonates very much with the ideas of Lynn Margulis who spoke about bacteria creating life on earth through evolution by creating life creating themselves so kind of some chose to become for for whatever reasons you know we're not trying to explain it but yes yeah, some chose to become plants and some chose to become mobile and to move around and become uh, anima animals, um, humans, and so on. So it's just like, we, we, we really are very curious of this idea of agency. And and also, I guess, uh, uh, Jean, Jean Lin, um, uh, what we spoke about, maybe you can see it later in the recording, if you're interested, we spoke about this idea of not only, right? Like opening every animal or a plant or insect or a stone or 
whoever we meet or what, whatever or whoever, right? We meet on the way to, to this idea of not only, to not knowing who they are and also referring a little bit to uh, Edouard Glissant, this idea of uh, opacity that we, we are kind of... Uh, Western world is obsessed with this transparency, but we can also leave some idea, some place for opacity, for not knowing. And, but still kind of respecting the other, how they are. So Michelle has a question. Yeah, it's not so much a question, but just to respond, to say firstly hi to Sabine and Igor, lovely to see you. Um, and uh, thank you so much uh, for creating this uh, the space and this moment. Um, and I just want to share with the, the online experience. So I'm here in Cape Town, South Africa, and uh, and I have got to know um, uh, Sabine and Ego um, through the the many uh, the online spaces, and uh, and I just find the engagement um, such a sense of uh, refuge uh, in my own chaos of you know, academia and finishing this PhD that I need to hand in. And, uh, and, and also many of the scholars, um, uh, Haraway and Steng, you, you just bring such simplicity to it because uh, uh, a lot of the reading can be so intense um, and you have to read the a, a couple of times. And, uh, and so, I, so I always find a sense of like, ah, you know, that's, kind of what Sting is maybe saying, or um, if she's speaking about the cosmopolitan ag agendas. So yeah, so, so I really appreciate that because I am in the university space and um, it's a challenging space to navigate uh, the unknown and the unseen because unseen everything is so uh, deterministic. And, um, and um, I myself now am joining the chemical engineering department um, with a program on trust transitions, which is a partnership with Germany, Colombia, and South Africa. So I'm, I'm. So I also just feel so grateful to um, just go to your website sometimes. So yeah, I always look forward to the to the newsletters. So yeah, so yeah, so so thanks for experimenting and sort of yeah coming out to yeah the broader world thanks thank you michelle from from, from berlin yeah thanks uh -huh. thank you there was a question of uh, what was the name of the poet that you mentioned at the beginning poet uh the poet i mentioned amaury maybe ah uh see si, amaury pacheco a cuban poet you're the only poeta yes thank you andrea Hmm. Operational poetics, yes. That's, uh... <laughs> Thank you for, for the collective effort. Collective practice, that's, that's <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, and I guess maybe just to finish, kind of also to... Um, to refer to to Yeyo, what you were asking, uh, since also Bayo, I guess, was or is now in the conference. I'm not sure. We didn't, unfortunately, have a chance to attend any other sessions yet because, yeah, these days are quite intense, um, and we were just finishing our winter trail as well yesterday. But Bayo uh, offered us this when he came to the seasonal academy last winter. He offered us this idea of making sanctuary, and and I think this winter trail, even though um, well, I, I don't I don't know to, to to make it a short story or a long story. Let's make it a shorter story for now. But just to say that we we could really live into it this winter because um, this winter trail, each session we held in a different place because through this nomadic uh, movement. And it's incredible to notice how each place affects how we think, how we feel, how we interact. Like it's it's really incredible. And and also Marisol, 
whom you mentioned earlier, uh, in her book Earth Beings, she speaks of this idea of Tiracuna, that also Quechua people, uh, I guess it's in, it is in Quechua, the Tira, you know, from Tierra and Cuna as, as, as the persons. Um, and, and this kind of one word, so that, that people and the land and like the place, people are not separated. And when I say people, yeah, referring back to, to what we were speaking just now, that it's all kinds of persons, right? Human and more than human. Mm. But that it's indeed not separated. And we could really feel it in this winter through the nomadic, uh, nomadic movement, through the fact that each session was held in a different location. Hmm. True. I feel like that's making me think about the way that uh, there's like a, I feel a calling for new temporalities. And so it's like an idea can come, you know, so someone plants a seed of making sanctuary, but we don't know. And when we think about this on the level of geologic time, remember, like we just have so little grasp on like how long things take to germinate or to grow or to die or to compost. And so um, I feel just feel a real openness and um, remember that part of modernity's curse a bit is like the um, urgency with which everything is presented. And I feel like one of the things that I appreciate about these explorations and yeah, the moving from place to place and allowing ourselves to be influenced by the agency of the place, right? The spirit of the place um, also creates this re different relationship with time. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, it, it was for me very alive yesterday because yesterday I was quite worried for Ukraine and, and this situation. And also suddenly the sense of urgency comes like, oh, we need to do something now quickly like suddenly you start to be in this in this urgent kind of uh, neurotic uh, move, mood no and like thinking about your friends or relatives or like whatever uh, and then i was funny enough we were just passing the the mine here in, in the north of spain but you know despite the fact that yeah it is quite an abused place because it is a mine but those huge stones that were there they were really communicating to me something that I was very grateful to, to be in presence of because indeed, like the, 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 the time that the stones know, it's a very, very different time and there is no urgency. And it's like, you know, the, the, we were working with someone in the Andalusia in the south of Spain recently for a residency, a, a artistic residency. And there is a laguna that was uh, that was dried up by some farmers, apparently also illegally to plant uh, things. And and um, and this person, Carmit, with whom we were working, she said, "Well, what I sense from the laguna is that, well, yes, I, as a person, human person, I'm worried about the laguna because she has been dried up. Um, but when I connect to the laguna, what I hear is that." Laguna says, for me, it's just a moment in time. I'll come back, you know, it's kind of, yeah. And, and I feel like it's, it gives a very refreshing perspective on, on many things, connecting to this more than human entities and times. So there was a request um, by Emma uh, uh, a while ago asking um, if we might all hold up our drawings now as a collective. Um, Perhaps that might be a parting gesture. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, thank you, Emma. I can hold up a cat. <laughs> Whoa, it's amazing. If you're recording, Michelle, as you're recording, if you're not in the gallery view, you might want to switch to that because otherwise Zoom will just record the speaker view for just one person. I'm in the view. I can see the whole 
Ah, yes, then it's, That's great. Then it's good. Okay. Yes. Wow. It's well, also think... amazing to notice like like the connections in the drawings, no? Like there, there's some flow definitely in, in the collective non-verbal dialogue that happens here. Some synchronicity as well. Well, also there is a kind of an under, under, under story, the underworld. The understory, yeah. The understory world where things are connected and there are so, the mycelium story. so many things going on. Yeah, it reminds me of this diversity that you might see if you stick your head in in the soil once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> for refreshing you might perspective. Need to, you might need to be a worm for that for that moment, but mm -hmm. <laughs> I just wanted to say I have a friend, she has a beautiful project that she sticks the head to the to the floor and she made the now like many years ago I read she's called Caterina Grau she made that kind of hat that has some um, looks like horns but in fact they are roots and the suggestion is to become a corn root so you put your head in the floor with that object and imagine the world from the perspective of the roots of the corn it's a beautiful image I will look and try to share in the chat Ah yes, that would be great if you if you can or or maybe her name then we can search for the drawing for the for the picture. It's just reminding me that the workshop where I met Igor and Sabina was this workshop with Nico and we made the I have right here we were we became birds and ah. and this was the mask <laughs> that I made and I use it all the time. So I think we need to like do more weird experimentation and becoming creatures and i'm so thankful yes. for your work <laughs> that's so nice <laughs> wow. made out of recycled materials yeah that's so beautiful well you know this crafting futures this spring trail we we hope to be doing that we we hope to because you know the laguna it, le it left a mark because there are a lot of birds there and of course the birds were very disappointed when the laguna was dried up because it's a, this place in Andalusia close to Cadiz it's a, it's a place where a lot of migrant birds come between on their way from African continent to European continent to maybe maybe also even when they go to Asia I'm not sure exactly all the routes but some definitely uh, it's an important location for them and I started to make a bird when I was there and uh, we thought well this bird will fly into the spring hopefully and then maybe it can be crafted more but yes crafts we need definitely more crafts as ways of thinking as well so nice to see this mask again <laughs> so there's about two minutes left in the session um, how do we want to conclude It's impossible to conclude, but <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> and thank you, Michelle, also for helping with the, all the holdings of the of this session. And thank you. All.